Hey, what's up guys? Chad here with the Reptile Rangers. Now we're at the Kernersville Reptile Zoo and Medical Center again today and we're going to talk about a pretty cool venomous snake that's native to the United States. Uh, but before we get into that, right here in this corner is going to be our subscriber button. Make sure to hit that if you're on your cell phone, widen that up to the full screen and you'll see that right down there in that bottom right hand corner, the RR watermark. Right. Let's go right into this. Awesome, absolutely beautiful, beautiful snake is the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. It's incredibly popular uh, amongst captive keepers as being a relatively hardy snake, easy to care for. Yes, they are fairly dangerous. They can be f uh, fairly unpredictable, uh, but they are most commonly kept uh, one of the most commonly kept rattlesnake species with inside of the uh, of the herping or reptile community. Now, it's known as the uh, scientific name Crotalus atrox uh, is the scientific name. It's in the viper species. These are also in the pit viper species, uh, which has the additional heat sensing pits. But as you'll be able to see here in a few minutes, we're going to kind of get up over the top of it and show you some defining marks of this guy. Uh, but we'll show you some of the, the features that is uh, indicative to the Western Diamondback as well as some of your Viper species. Now, you're going to find these all over the Midwestern United States, including Mexico. These guys right here are probably responsible for more snake bites uh, and deaths due to venomous snake bite in the United States than any other snake. These guys can be fairly temperamental. Some of them are incredibly laid back, very easy going, but by and large, the biggest portion of them will be very, very temperamental. Now, these guys are known for standing their ground. They'll stand, they'll get up into that S position, and they'll rattle that tail really, really, really hard, trying to give the warning that they're there, uh, especially if something gets too close, and then if that does not work in defense, as far as a deterrent, just warning them not to come closer, they will strike, uh, and they'll strike very, very quickly. Uh, they have a hemotoxic venom, uh, which causes a basic breakdown of the blood cells, the red blood cells. It causes excessive bleeding. You can get some necrotic effect from, uh, from the uh, underlying venom where swelling may occur wherever the bite happened, whether hand, uh, feet, toes, fingers, whatever the case may be. Swelling can happen there. If there's swelling, then there's a pretty good chance that it's going to have a necrosis uh, or a necrotic effect to the skin tissue and muscle and tendons and bone and stuff uh, unless treated otherwise. Now, when it comes to antivenom, this is treated by Crofab, uh, which is readily available throughout most of the United States. Now, let me make something clear that antivenom is not a drug that fixes the problem. Basically, antivenom is venom turned against itself, uh, whether uh, created synthetically in a laboratory or whether built up by antibodies uh, through injection of like a horse or something along that line, uh, where that was how it was done years and years ago, back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, things like that. Uh, they would inject horses with uh, a little bit at a time and increase the amounts to build up, uh, allow the horses to build up a basic immunity or antibodies to it, and then they would redraw that back out uh, and then do what they needed to do with the uh, venom from there, creating thus an anti-venom. Uh, but like I said, this is not a drug that fixes damage. It just stops the venom dead in its tracks and keeps the venom from causing any more damage. Now, with the Western Diamond back here, let's go, let's go up over the top of this guy. Let's check some stuff out. How's that? Okay, so as you can see in this Western Diamondback, right over the top of his head, if we're looking at the head shape, this is one of the times in which we talk about the triangular shaped head and the cat eyes. You can see the triangular shaped head and right on the back side of his head, and without see if we can do it without him moving too much. Right there right underneath where the hook is on those two sides those are the venom glands all right so those big puffy things on the back side of his head are his venom gland and of course we can see the rattle now this guy's lost some of his some of his rattle here as they grow and as they age you can see each one of these is a button it's what we call a button that makes up the brunt of the rattle the longer the rattle is the more buttons he's going to have now the Western Diamondback will have those black and white bands along with a couple of other species have off-colored bands uh, on the tip of the tail there. But that's another characteristic trait to the Western Diamondback. But the main way that we know a Western and an Eastern Diamondback is the telltale diamonds that they have all down their spine. You can see the diamond there. You can see the diamond there. Diamond there. That's where they get the name Western Diamondback 
rattlesnake. Now, these guys are quite a bit lighter than the eastern diamondbacks. The eastern diamondbacks are more native to a heavy forested region, much darker, greener area. So their bodies are much blacker than what most of the western diamondbacks will be, which they're more sand color because they're native to more of a deserty, arid, semi-forested region. Now, if you take a look right here, right in front of where the hook is at, you'll see the nostril. Then you'll see the heat sensing pit right behind it right there. Now, if you notice his eyes, his eyes do have the cat-like up and down feature. Even though his pupils are a little bit more round at the particular moment, he does have more of the straight up and down pupils. This is another sign of, of course, your viper species. Now, again, we try and tell people all the time, don't just go off the triangular shaped head and the cat eyes to indicate as to whether a venomous snake or not venomous snake, because that only applies in a very few amount of species. Now this is the beautiful Western Diamondback rattlesnake. And as you can see, he's getting a little, little twitch, little twitch, little twitch. He's like, eh, I'm not sure if I want to, I'm not sure if I don't. <laughs> These are absolutely amazing and beautiful animals. These guys are in huge, huge help to the ecosystem. Unfortunately, there's such a thing called rattlesnake roundups that go on in, in places like Texas where it's incredibly cruel. They go out and grab these snakes, sew their mouths shut, use them in exhibitions, and then, of course, kill them and take the hide for the leather trade, things like that. The way that they do this is, is incredibly cruel and unusual to the animal itself because they'd have a big problem with people sewing cats' mouths shut and dogs' mouths shut and you know, their personal pet inside the house. Uh, but uh, you know, mo most people don't think about that when, when it comes down to uh, something that they're afraid of or something that they just don't like and then you know, it's, it's uh, all bets are off. But anyways, these are absolutely amazing, amazing creatures and they're great, incredibly great for the ecosystem. Understand that their venom, uh, not just their venom, but the venom of all different reptiles is being utilized for all kinds of medical breakthrough treatment as well. Uh, hemotoxins can be used for things like blood thinner, a more natural blood thinner. Um, things like neurotoxins can be used for painkiller because it's uh, kind of the same thing. It's like a nerve block. So understand, there's a lot of great that these animals are out here for. Now you can see what he's doing there. He's doing the, uh, the tongue. He's sticking his tongue out. He's trying to, catch a, trying to catch a bead on the air. They'll stick it out and they can flick it up or down or side to side. They're trying to uh, try figure out a direction. As uh, you can see, he's trying to catch a bead on exactly, you know, what am I doing, what am I not doing. He feels the, uh, the breath from my, uh, uh, from my mouth and the wind coming out from me talking. And so he's also checking that to see, you know, see what that is, uh, make sure that it's nothing that's going to be damaging to him. Now, again, this is... The Western Diamondback Rattlesnake, also known as the Crotalus atrox. Amazing species. These guys get anywhere from about four to about six feet. We have, we have seen specimens as big as six and a half, seven feet. It's kind of a rarity, but most of the time you're looking four to six feet. They are a live birther. They do give uh, birth to live young. Um, and when the babies come out, they come out fully loaded and fully able to survive and fend for themselves. All right, now, this again is... The Western Diamondback Rattlesnake, I'm Chad. This is the Reptile Rangers. We are the Kernelsville Reptile Zoo and Medical Center. We appreciate you following along week after week after week. We appreciate your subscription. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Hit the bell for notification. Uh, make sure to write us in. Let us know of other things you want us to film about. And uh, if you need anything, our information will be in the description below. Uh, we have people writing us in or calling us all the time, asking us questions about help with their animal or feeding or housing, whatever. Uh, we're here to help and we're happy to do so. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed this video on the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake, uh, one of the pit vipers native to the United States, the Western and, and deep Southwestern United States. Uh, awesome species. And uh, we appreciate you following along week after week after week. We'll either see you here at the zoo or we'll see you on the next episode. Later.